Okay, so I was asked to make two presentations. So I have, I was asked to present a research paper, and this is a research paper, and then I'll uh, present a general uh, lecture on dynamics of institutions. This is technically simple. The other presentation is technically hard. So I thought that um, at least you will have this in a reasonable, uh, in a reasonable uh, part of the of the day. So, uh, this is a joint paper with Daniel Dermeyer and Georgi Yegorov, and I sent the wrong presentation, but it's the same presentation, but of course I changed this to Ursia. Okay. Uh, 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 so, uh, everybody knows, every economist knows, and every great economist said this, that for sustainable development, an economy needs uh, good institutions that protect property rights. And the intuition is simple. You need to have incentives for investment, you need to have incentives to exert efforts, and institutions of property rights protection, they uh, they provide these incentives. Every single great economist of our uh, of the last 300 years said this. Adam Smith, Douglas North, Andre Schleifer, and Rona Simoglu, all of them said this. So basically, uh, this is for sure. Then, now, uh, where do the property rights come about? The property rights uh, protection comes uh, from some political authority. For example, Parliaments pass le legislation to protect property rights, and the executive power enforces uh, laws to protect property rights. Um, what are the source of problems with property rights? For hundreds of years, economists were concerned with the problem that the government might be the main threat to property rights. For example, an unconstrained executive could use force to expropriate uh, his or her subjects. Or, in another example, a majority could legislate expropriation. For example, when a parliament passes a law that imposes a progressive tax, then in terms of economic incentives to produce and to exert efforts, this is basically um, a disincentives. This is a poor protection of property rights. Then, once we have this, a prob this as a problem, and we know that uh, we know that uh, government might be a threat to property rights, what are the uh, what are the remedies? What are the solutions to this? And one uh, remedy is the idea of checks and balances. That the checks and balances, they in the government, they help to protect property rights. So how do checks and balances uh, work? At least in theoretical models, the long tradition emphasizes the role of uh, veto players. For example, Douglas North and Barry Weingast, uh, writing on Glorious Revolution in a very important paper, they discussed the introduction of new veto players and the increased role of parliament as something that protected property rights of its subject and then helped economic development. Uh, similarly, Darana Simoglu and Jim Robinson, they modeled broadening of franchise, meaning which basically increased the number of empowered players. Before the increase, there were only rich elite. After the increase, there were the rich elite, the middle class, and then the poor, and this also helped property rights and economic development. Also, equally long tradition in um, economic theory literature emphasizes the role of supermajority requirement. Basically, the higher is the supermajority requirement to pass a law that expropriates something, the um, more protection of property rights we have. Now, this paper, the idea is to challenge in a theoretical, in a very simple theoretical model, the usual uh, reasoning about the role of veto players and show that in a dynamic environment, or better to say, in an environment where we have some uh, dynamic considerations, there will be endogenous veto players. And these endogenous veto players, they basically reverse all the effects of normal uh, veto players. So we will be able to disentangle the static and dynamic effect of beta players and the uh, supermajority requirements, and this will show that the naive intuition, at least, about the role of beta players and the degree of supermajority is somewhat, uh, somewhat flawed. So, this paper is related to many literatures. 
um, there is a literature on uh, dynamic legislative bargaining uh, with uh, evolving status quo, meaning that uh, there are there are several agents who form a parliament or a committee, then they uh, discuss a decision, then they settle on some decision, then they go to the next period, and the decision of the previous period is the status quo of the current period. And this is actually a better model of uh, how political di dynamics work than many models that assume a finite horizon or uh, an exogenous default option. And also there is a bit big literature on dynamic decision making, uh, decision making and voting. Now, I will start with a couple of simple examples, then I'll show you the setup, uh, the theorems, uh, what we call endogenous Vita players, and if I have time, by the way, how much time do I have? So, okay, but there are no questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, if there are no questions, I will show you two applications and conclude. So, we'll start with a very simple example. Uh, it basically it appeared in a paper by Dermer and Fong, but they didn't understand the importance of this, uh, of this example. So, we have three players. There is majority voting, and the first player is agenda setters. And we assume from the very beginning that if uh, a player is indifferent between uh, the proposal and the status quo, then he or she supports, if indifferent. In the paper, we have a lot of robustness checks, which, which include what happens if we relax this assumption, but uh, for this simple example, just have this assumed that uh, they support if indifferent. So we have uh, 10 indivis indivisible units to allocate by voting, and four, three, allocation 433 is uh, status quo. Right, so how to think about this? We think about this as both the consumption in the current period and the status quo for bargaining in the next period. So if, for example, they settle forever on this outcome, then each of the infinity of subsequent periods, they receive, uh, they receive this amount of um, uh, units of, of goods. Now, so uh, the first observation is this, uh, this allocation 433 is stable in the following sense. First, before that, suppose that uh, there is only one round of voting. So there is no evolving status quo, there is just one round of voting and then they consume everything and the game stops then what should be, what is going to be the outcome? Remember, the first player is the agenda setter, so he could make any proposal. So what is going to happen? No, no, no. What's, the, what's your proposal, Sergei? Uh, everything for me and nothing for everybody else. Could you formulate it in, in the model yeah, terms? Yeah. What you propose? 10 zero, 0 you're voted down. Yeah. Both Players two and three vote against you. Seven three zero. Great, Daniel. Uh, uh, Daniel proposes seven three zero. So the agenda setter obviously likes seven more than four. Uh, the second player supports because he's indifferent, and the third player is against, but the only the majority is required. So seven three zero passes, and that's the end of it. Now. Okay, so this what what would happen if the game continues for one period and then stops. But now, suppose that, as I said, this game is played uh, each period for infinity. Suppose that players one, uh, number one and number two vote for uh, allocation five for one, right? So actually both players w one and two are better off here than uh, in the uh, initial point, right? So they support this. But then, if this is the status quo, then player number one, who is the sole agenda setter, he could propose to move to 811. And both uh, player number one, obviously, and player number three will vote for this move, right? 
So both players uh, prefer, uh, two players prefer to move here. So player number two found uh, himself in 811, where he has less than he had in the um, initial status quo, right? So, making the same, um, the same calculation in his head, player number two now would not support the proposal to move to 541. Or in the case of uh, Daniel's example, player number two would not vote for 730, because he knows that if he supports going to 730, the next period it will be 10-0-0, right? Because now player three um, will, will, will be supporting this. So now... What? There's a CHWE guy who published a paper in 2004 and chat about the former risking status. Thousands of uh, people published papers uh, in 2004. This is a specific paper that you know, goes away from this time discounting to people thinking about what's going to happen in the future. Okay, hundreds of, people, hundreds of people published papers. And a specific person, C-H-W-E. Yeah. Oh, Michael Chair, I remember Chair. him. him uh, I remember him in the 80s when he was visiting Ktsimi on the Himovsky Prospect. Yeah, I know. He never studied anything like this. Um, okay. Uh, so, at, at I, I demonstrated to you that uh, this is stable. In, in, in this sense, and obviously 532, uh, for example, is not stable. Why it's not stable? Because player number one could safely propose to move to second to, to 622, and here player number three is not afraid of moving to uh, here because uh, this is stable, so he's not worse off uh, in, in the rest of the game. Now, let's. Uh, Let's continue working with simple examples, but now we have five players, again 10 units, again majority, uh, majority vo voting, and number one, uh, player number one is both the Vita player and agenda setter. Obviously, if we have only one agenda setter, then uh, this agenda setter is, uh, this player is effectively a Vita, a Vita, uh, a Vita player. Now we could go through stable allocations here. Obviously, when everything belongs to Guy number one, uh, this is stable. This is 91000 is not stable because the coalition of uh, first player one, two, three, one, three, four, and five will support moving to, uh, to this. Similarly, uh, the allocation of 81100 is not stable because uh, players number four and number five would support uh, paper, player number one proposal to move here, right? But, but this allocation, okay. Why 91000 is not stable? It's not stable because players number three, four and five would vote for player number one proposal to move to this allocation. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Because yeah, they're indifferent. I, I thought that stable only one round, that the next one would be stable. Sorry. No, no, yep. Yeah, yes. Um, so now, this allocation, 7, uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, and 0 is stable, right? And actually, this simple example demonstrates the whole idea, the whole idea of this paper. Excuse me, yeah? Yeah, well, now, now the question is, what place? why 7, 1, 1, 1, 0 is stable? What? I mean, okay, two, that's, that's the whole, 3 and 4 are going to go to change the allocation. No. They wouldn't, because right. each of the players, number two, number three, and number uh, four, knows that if one of them is expropriated, then all of them are expropriated. So they have incentives to protect each other in equilibrium. Yes, but yeah. they may assign two for everybody. They, they may be better off. No, they cannot. I, I would vote, for instance, uh, two, 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 and that would be stable, and I'm better off. Stop. Uh, stop. Uh, the first player is both agenda setter and oh, okay. he is well, the Vita player. So he so. can never be yes. made worse yes. off, right? So what they could expropriate, they could expropriate only each other. 
So this is stable because e each of them knows that if one of them is expropriated, then uh, the rest of them is expropriated. <coughs> so this is the whole idea of endogen endogenous Vita groups. They are not Vita players by, by design, but in equilibrium, they know that they need to protect uh, to protect each other. They, they kind of they protect each. They protect each. Uh, they protect each other. To, yeah. To okay. Sequential yeah. Appropriation and yeah, I I so n now, suppose that we make player number two a Vita player. So we grant in in this allocation we grant um, player number two the Vita power, just totally exogenous Vita power. Right now, this allocation is no longer stable. Why it is not lo no longer stable? Because player number two can now agree to expropriate these two guys, and for example, to move to eight two zero zero zero. Because because of Vita power, he does not need to protect other guys, right? So uh, of course, it's as far fetched as um, an interpretation of a, a small model here. Uh, but but still, we have this interpretation. We add formal protection. Right? We make player number two a Vita player, and this basically destroys, uh, destroys an equilibrium in which they protect, uh, protect each other. Okay, now, we are, um, we are done with simple examples, and basically I hope I conveyed the whole idea of the paper, it's about this 71110. Uh, now the general case. We have N agents, and B units to divide. Uh, all our allocations, they are discrete, they are integer, and they are positive. The time is discrete and ex is indexed by T. In each period, there is a status quo. The initial status quo is exogenous, and the next status quo is determined by voting. So this is um, mm, okay, an example of a legislative bargaining with endogenous, endogenous status quo. All agents maximize, uh, maximize uh, their lifetime utility function and the discount factor is very close to one. So like to make it not a research presentation but an educational presentation, why we typically need the discount factor in voting models to be close to one? Okay, it's actually it, it was not a question to you, Kuhn, <laughs> but still, yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's. Kind of it's uh, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> no. It's 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 not a folk theory. Uh, the th the, yeah, okay. Now, the, the thing is that it's very difficult. It's, it's quite easy to work when discount factor is close to zero. So we care only about the current state. When the discount factor is clo close to one, then we actually care only about the state, which is the ultimate outcome, the ultimate stable st state. And we do not care about the path that we take toward this uh, ultimate stable set. But the problem is that when you have an intermediate discount factor, you need to care not only about the ultimate outcome, but the path that takes to this outcome. But the problem is that the space of paths is much more, is much larger and a much more complicated space than the space of states. Remember, if you have two states, just two states, like zero and one, then the number of paths between them is uncountable and there is no natural order on this space. So it's, this space is very large and very difficult to deal with. So here we work with the discount factor close to one. It's a kind of, it's a technicality, but this is a kind of a technicality which you would always encounter in models of voting over, uh, over states. So this is a kind of a, both a strong assumption and a kind of a necessary thing to do with this kind of uh, these kind of models. So now uh, to make it a formal game to change allocation, you need to have a majority of voters to agree, and we focus on k majority, so at least k 
this is a parameter. We have a number of Vita players and we have a supermajority requirement. So if k is uh, one half of the number of players, this is just a regular majority. If k is larger than one half, this means uh, one half of n, this is a su supermajority requirement. And we need um, we need protocol to make this a proper game theory ga non-cooperative game. So there is an ordering of legislators, and uh, we assume that only Vita players are gender setters, and the protocol both orders uh, the order in which they vote and orders the um, them in order in which they uh, make proposals. Now, eventually, when we focus on equilibrium, we uh, require that this equilibria are protocol-free, which means that they are not dependent on protocols. But still, to have this as a non-cooperative game, we need to have, we need to define the order of moves. Now, okay, so, uh, each period, they, uh, they start with the given status quo, they vote in a sequence given by protocol. If the set of those who voted for a proposal then uh, is uh, larger than the required the supermajority requirement, then transition occurs. And if uh, no proposal, no proposal get enough votes, then the status quo persists. And then each player gets instantaneous payoffs, and the uh, outcome of this period is the. Uh, status quo of the next period. Now, the equilibrium is the mark of perfect equilibrium and pure strategies, and as I said, here, whenever indifferent they vote yes in the paper, we discuss more, um, more cases. Now, once we define the game, once we have chosen an equilibrium concept, and once we pick up a particular equilibrium, with each equilibrium, we could associate a transition mapping, something that tells us where we move from one state to another in this equilibrium. Like with every equilibrium, you could, you could associate a transition mapping. Once you have a transition mapping, you could define what is a stable allocation. A stable allocation is the fixed point of this transition mapping. And uh, basically, we could restrict ourselves to dealing with the equilibria where we move immediately to stable, uh, to stable allocations. First, there is a formal result that for the discount factor large enough, close uh, one enough, there always exists a mark of perfect equilibrium. And for all the mark of perfect equilibria, regardless of protocol, we have the same uh, set of fixed points. So once we talk about stable, stable allocations, we could ignore all the uh, things that we said about non-cooperative games. The stable set doesn't depend on the order in which they vote or on the order in which they, in which they propose. Now, this is good, because now we could concentrate on the stable, stable allocations rather than on the games that lead to these stable allocations. Now, uh, back 60 years ago, John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern tried to give a general definition of stability. It didn't work out as well as they thought, because although this is a general, general definition of stability, it doesn't help much in many kind of circumstances. But in our particular circumstances, this uh, von neumann morgenstern logic is very powerful and helps to describe stable allocations in a simple way. So, what is the general definition of stability? We have a set of states, it's a finite number of states. We have a relationship between two states. We say that one state dominates another state. Formally, a relationship is just a subset of the Cartesian product of two copies of the state. And then we say that the set of states, the subset of the big state is stable if it satisfies the following two requirements. First, internal stability, meaning that if we took any two states from the set S, then 
neither of them dominates the other. And the external stability, that for any state outside of a stable state, there is exists a state in the stable set which dominates this, um, uh, this outside, outside state. And this is a very general definition of stability. So when we apply this definition to a particular problem, we need to define what is the set of states. We already defined this. We need, we need to define what is the uh, dominance relationship. Here, the dominance relationship uh, of one state dominates another if there are enough votes to move there, including all of the, all of the Vita players. And there exists a Vita player who is absolutely better off in this new allocation. So, for example, just to continue the previous example, if we have five players, 10 units, the majority voting, and player number one is Vita player, then this allocation dominates this allocation, this allocation dominates this allocation, this allocation dominates this allocation. In each of these cases, there are enough votes to move from here to here, and no Vita players, no Vita player is worse off in the former. Okay, there is a relatively big literature on non-cooperative foundations of von Neumann or Morgenstern stable set, and it's not necessarily unique. Um, uh, but now let me. Let me describe all the stable allocations. I'll give you a general, general description. Then I'll show some, uh, I'll show some uh, examples to uh, explain how it works. So, in this model, an allocation is stable uh, if and only if the set of non-Vita players is divided into a number of groups. Here is the number, and this means. Uh, that this is the integer part of this number. In this number of groups, uh, e each, any two groups have the same size, and for any two members of each group, they have the same, uh, the same uh, number of units, basically the same wealth. So you could think of this, and we informally talk about this as economic classes. So we have D very rich people, then D uh, less rich people, and so on, then there is a, the rest of them. This, the last class might have a different size, and it might be empty, and there are the Vita players. Obviously, because Vita players cannot be worse off in equilibrium, they could have an arbitrary amount of um, wealth in a, in a stable set. Now, here is an, exa here is an example. This is uh, an example of stable set. We have nine players, and we have two Vita players, and we have the mm, supermajority requirement of seven. So you need to have seven votes to expropriate someone, right? Now, the theorem gives us the size of each class. The size of each, is, each class is three here. So we need to have three, three players form a group which protects each other from redistribution. These guys, these three guys, they protect each other from redistribution. These three guys also protect each other from redistribution. These two guys are uh, the Vita players. So now, uh, suppose that we started, something happened, and we started with this kind of situation. So what is going to happen? We are going to move to a stable allocation which needs to have two classes of size three. It will be right. So now that we think, what is the way to move from this situation to from this allocation to an allocation where we have two classes of size three, maximizing the uh, value for those who are not expropriated in equilibrium? Obviously, this guy, uh, the Khodorkovsky guy, is the um, guy to be expropriated here. So they expropriate four units, give this to these guys, otherwise they would not support, uh, support this transition. Also, also, if uh, player number six would not be given this unit, then players number four and players number five 
are not going to support this move because they would fear that if the, uh, their class looks like this, then they're not protected because now player number six doesn't have incentives to protect at least, at least these two units. So they're going to eventually move uh, to, this, to this location or to an location where player number two got some of, the, uh, of these two, two units. So is everything clear about the example and the general theory of economic classes? So basically Kropotkovsky gets expropriated because he was too rich compared to the other oligarchs. You could interpret <laughs> this story like yeah. this, yeah. Okay, in, 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 this, in this model, in an, in an unstable situation, the richest guy has problems of forming a coalition. If there are not enough uh, players who have the same amount of wealth, they do not have incentives to protect him from expropriation. Or another reinterpretation, Khodorkovsky didn't allocate his wealth to be a veto player. I mean, if I have a look, for instance, and a veto Okay, as I said, we, we, we try to interpret this, um, uh, this theory as something that shed li sheds, sheds light on the interaction between formal institutions and informal institutions. Mm -hmm. And we treat Vita, uh, the, uh, the, the Vita playership, the um, fact that someone is a Vita player, as a totally exogen exogenous protection. So you cannot make your, yourself a Vita player. But actually, we, we, we don't do this in this model, but you could also interpret this as if, if you share something, you might become a part of the class that is protected. If you start from, an, from an unstable situation, right here. Yeah. John? Isn't it the implication of this that um, more Right. More unequal situations would be more stable in the sense of, um, in other words, would it be better to have a bunch of billionaire oligarchs without multi-billionaires and then ordinary people versus a more even distribution of lot of Okay, th this model is not good enough to answer this question because we have all the stable allocations have the same structure. There is a number of classes, but we. We, do not, we cannot have a comparative statics with respect to, um, to the inequality between these classes of fixed size. Obviously, it would be interesting, but in this model, there is no such effect. So there is no measure of inequality? No. That's very natural to be seen. Okay, uh, yeah, obviously, there is natural uh, measure of inequality here. You could order all these allocations in terms of uh, in terms of inequality, but we do not have any kind of meaningful, uh, meaningful comparative statics with respect to this. So, like, what happens after you move from one unequal situation to, like, for example, to less uh, or more equal situation, that depends not only on the inequality, but on the way how to you redistributed these units even given the same change in inequality. If you take all the stable allocations and then average them in some sense, can you make this? Let me show you. This is a stable allocation. Yeah. If you move these three units, one, two, three, here, you will move to a much more equal society, which is not more or less stable. It's as stable as the previous one. Right. But so that, that's... Set of all allocations and you have a subset of Yes. And then this subset of stable <coughs> locations, if you compare it to a, a set of unstable locations, can you, can you, can you, I mean, I don't know what no. this even makes uh, sense. What I'm saying, no, uh, like uh, move this unit here and move this unit here, so you will have an unstable location. Now, move all of these, uh, all of these six units here, right? This new will be much more unequal than the previous one, but it's stable and the, uh, this very equal is unstable. So, as I said, there is, I mean, if some, I, I, no, no, there is no, no natural. Yeah. 
Oh no! If you if you if you have a good theorem about this, I will be happy to know. Yeah. Okay. Now, one initial question here is is initial question with any kind of a dynamic model with a lot of votings is whether this model is robust to the following five, uh, five um, assumptions that we made. First, whether the discount factor is close to one. As I said, it's robust in the sense that we do not know how to solve this model for discount factors which are not close to one. Uh, to the discrete units of redistribution, basically uh, our, our model is robust to this. So in, in a sense that if you make these discrete units as small as possible, so you just basically um, take the size of units close to one, then the limit is, looks very much like uh, our description of a stable set. In this sense, it is robust. But at the same time, if we move from discrete units to continuous units, so any kind of epsilons could move could be moved from one agent to another, then uh, the, the whole result collapses. So it's robust in some sense, not robust in another sense. The second, uh, the third issue, the proposal power. We have proposal power allocated only to the uh, Vita players who cannot be made worse off because they are Vita players. It's it's a good question. It's a good question what happens if the proposal power could be in principle allocated to other players. And the answer, the simple answer is that this model is not robust to this. If you give proposal power to other players, to, to those who are going to be expropriated in equilibrium, then uh, they, uh, there are equilibria where very different things happen. Things that are very different from what we described. Now, the next thing is that we assume that players vote yes if they, if they are indifferent. And this is basically the same assumption to say that there is no transaction cost to move from the status quo to, to, a, new, um, to a new state. Okay, uh, our results are somewhat, somewhat, uh, somewhat robust, uh, robust to this. And this is, uh, this is an assumption which is maintained in most of the papers in this literature, but not, uh, not in all papers. Finally, initial question to ask, initial question to ask here, what happens if we do not, um, if we do not, if we look beyond uh, pure strategy equilibria to uh, mixed strategy equilibria? And the answer is that then our results are not robust. Basically, as in most of the legislative bargaining literature, if the agenda setters could make a mixed strategy proposals, then they could expropriate everything from uh, non-VITA non players. And this happens in this model yeah. as well. Excuse me. Yeah. Just for, uh, for the sake of the presentation, the four point and the second are almost the same, right? So if I have a continuous, then the, the indifference can be mi changed minimally. For an absolute, if I allow for a discrete uh, yeah, in the sense distribution, then the yes just falls apart by, by definition. Because I, I'm epsilon better. Yeah, okay. I mean, the two okay, classes, the right? Yes and no. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, uh, what you say is a kind of intuitively correct, but yeah, not ma right. mathematically uh, not correct. Because all of these, uh, there are a lot of issues related to the way you change the order of taking limits. And there are a lot of sequences in mathematics where the resulting limit depends on the order in which you take limits. And here, this is a kind of a critical, a critical things. So you could have uh, this assumption 
and take this to uh, uh, to zero and have one kind of um, outcomes. And you could have this assumption and assume uh, small transaction costs, for example, if you uh, vote if you vote yes. And you will both have the same outcomes as before, but also some kind of new outcomes. So uh, this is a kind of the, like for a theorist, we typically assume that our intuition fails at the limit so here. Like we know that there are a lot of dangers there. I mean, what you said is is very plausible, but it's it's not easy to formalize this plausible argument. What happens if you do the complete opposite? So in real life, elections are intermittent every four to six years. So in real life, since life is finite, in fact, this contract is close to zero. Oh no! So in my life, I will have a few. No, the, the, the discount factor. The discount factor. Uh, okay, the discount factor of 0 0.99 corresponds to two votes per day, and this is not. It's it's actually uh, two, two votes per day for a parliament. It's not a kind of extreme extreme outlier on an issue. So uh, the real discount factors could be very close to very close to one. You cannot invalidate this model just saying that discount factor very close to one is unrealistic. Because it's realistic. There are other... Every day, and not even every year. So you can have a lot every day and try to do it with a lot of decisions. No, but if you think uh, not about formal votings, but the uh, all kind of back and forth discussions, for example, about budget allocations, it's, it's not outrageous uh, to assume that every day it's being discussed. And every day corresponds like 0 0.95 uh, discount, discount factor. Okay, now some comparative, uh, uh, some comparative statics. Uh, basically, this is just a formal result that shows that the intuition that I told you with the example of 7110 holds in a more general situation is that if we, uh, that the players in one economic class, they have very strong incentives to protect each other at an equilibrium, each of them knows that if one of them is expropriated, then each, uh, each one of, each other member of this class is going to be expropriated. Uh, then, now, uh, l let's uh, do some very simple, uh, comparative uh, comparative statics. So what happens if the majority requirement increases? So if uh, the major supermajority requirement is just the number of beta players of B plus one, then all non beta players form a single group. If instead, if we take the other extreme, if all the, uh, if there is the unanimity rule, so the supermajority requirement is an agent, then of course the size of each Vita group is, uh, is one. Between these two extremes, the number of uh, the Vita group, these economic classes, is weakly increasing in the supermajority super requirement. The intuition for this is as follows. When we increase the supermajority requirement, the groups become smaller. This means the, the Vita groups become smaller. The reason for this is that as the distribution becomes harder because you need to get more agents to vote for this, it takes few, fewer non-Vita players to form a group to defend themselves. And uh, of course the vice versa, the largest group, all non-Vita players, uh, non-Vita players need to help together is formed when a single vote from a non-Vita player is sufficient for Vita players to make redistribution, basically, because if one of the, uh, the non-Vita players is worse off than other non-Vita players, then he would uh, accept, he would support a move to a situation where everyone has the same uh, equal, equal amount. Now, just to just as I am about to say the most interesting things about this model. Um, so, just to... 
discuss the, the implications for our motivation for institutions of property rights protection. So what happens to a stable allocation when we change rules? For example, when we give someone an extra uh, veto power. Like if you look at the World Bank guidelines for developing countries, it's a kind of a common advice to say that the more veto players the country uh, has, veto players broadly construed like presidency, legislation, Supreme Court, uh, the better is, uh, uh, the better are institutions. Now, we are trying to start with a stable allocation and add, um, make one player an individual, an, an extra veto player. Or, for example, what happens if we increase the supermajority requirement? The naive intuition is that in both cases the expropriation is going to be harder, meaning that the property rights protection becomes better. Because if we add a, an extra veto player, this just a kind of hardens the possibility to pass an expropriation, an expropriation bill. The same way about supermajority. It seems that when we make a requirement, a supermajority requirement larger, we make it harder to make a decision. So it's harder to make a redistribution. In this model, the opposite is going to be. Uh, um, going to be true. Both a marginal increase in the number of veto players and a marginal increase in supermajority requirement, both of them uh, destroy a stable allocation and lead to a redistribution. Let me show you a simple example. So, uh, suppose we have um, uh, this is the status quo allocation. So we have nine players, five votes needed. The first player uh, and the second player are veto players. So then this allocation is stable, all right? Now, suppose that we uh, follow the naive intuition and make one more veto player, uh, one more player a veto player. We make player number three a veto player. Now, uh, this, the same allocation is no longer stable when we change these uh, formal institutions as move to 967 is accepted. So no, notice that more than the half of the society's wealth is, re, is uh, expropriated and almost half of the society members are expropriated here. So this is, not, this is not a kind of a small change. This is a large change. We make one player uh, better off by making uh, him a Vita player, but we make uh, almost half of the society worse because they expropriated. And they expropriated because in introducing a formal institution destroyed uh, an informal institution. Now, uh, the same thing about the supermajority, uh, supermajority requirement. We start with this, uh, uh, with this status quo. If only five votes needed, then this allocation with one veto player is stable. Now, if six votes are needed, then this allocation is not stable because this is now a stable allocation and they would accept this proposal. Although here there are uh, not much of the society is appropriated as a result of a change in the requirement, in tightening the requirement, but notice that the move to here is accepted by almost all the members of the society, all the main members uh, save for the guy who is, uh, who is expropriated. Mm, now, how much time do I have? Oh, great. Um, now, now that I told you two um, basic comparative status results, I could answer your question. Uh, the question was on one of your slides. Oh, uh, then I'll... Previously, it was why the guy that could not be expropriated, why increasing the, the veto one more would make it... Uh, less stable? No, it was... Le you this one? It was no, previously... previously. Uh, my point was, the guy that has zero has nothing to fear. Yeah, he doesn't fear, uh, yeah. but he also have nothing to lose from supporting. 
Yes, but it was like mm, three or four slides before, and I had okay. some other. No problem with this. Okay. okay. Yeah. Aren't you doing damage to the intuition about the majority voters? Because part of the Madisonian view is that adding veto pledge is not, it's not a formal exercise. It's also designed to increase transactions cost. That is to say, all the logic of the Federalist Papers is about that. The law too says things like that. They're not thinking about this in terms of game theory there. That's clear. They're, they're really, it's clear part of the intuition is to increase the transactions cost. What do you mean by increasing transaction costs in this context? I mean, what medicine meant here? What kind of transaction costs they increased? Well, Meaning, more, more likelihood of different things being... No, okay, then we d directly challenge the medicine's intuition here, because basically he said, then we add a Vita player, this will make uh, expropriation, expropriation harder. What we're saying that when you give uh, some, someone or some institution veto power, then this institution or this person is no longer a part of a coalition which defended each other. So by increasing the veto power of a particular agent, you could uh, decrease, you decrease the endogenous veto power of a whole group of agents. So basically, you do the reverse of what you wanted to do. You decrease the transaction costs. But you're doing it in, in this strange way, in which you both have the, yes, it's always OK if you don't get, because you always vote yes if you're not made worse off, combined with zero transaction costs. That's what I find very strange. It seems like almost the opposite of the intuition and logic of everything I've read about this, that's all. I mean, it's fine to do these models and to make an argument about it, but it seems to me it does damage to the original intuitions. Right, that's the whole idea. <laughs> well, but I, I started with this. I well, said that there are some naive people like Montesquieu or Madison who did these kind of fancy words without doing real analysis, and now we are kind of put a theoretical check to what they say. No, I, I make the opposite way. That there's these there's these smart guys who use fancy models to do damage to the intuition, and by us throwing away the intuition, can throw away anything. Can I ask a question? At least you the kind of thing. <laughs> you made the claim that improving the uh, vita powers, improving the property right protection, breaks down the stable allocation. Does it ever make worse the guy who gets the veto power? No. Oh, so that, that's that's that simple. No. The rights of everybody. Sure. Be fine. No, no. Uh, uh, th th that's true. That's true. If you could give veto power to everyone, then everyone is protected, and you have a kind of a. Um, it, it's not first best in this model because they are um, they are not Pareto Pareto ranked. But we will see in application two that you could make everybody like you could have a Pareto improvement by giving everyone veto power. What, what I'm saying that when you have an imperfect amount of veto power, an imperfect amount of protection, there is a tension between formal protection and equilibrium protection. So what you claimed in the slide was that improving does not help. It helps the guy who got the improvement. Yeah, yeah. Right. that's not. Uh, that's not a Pareto order, as I said. No, yeah, that's that are yeah, okay. But 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 do, doesn't that work because you basically introduce a strategic position by making non-strategic the arbitrary increase in veto power? So if I have ten and everybody's zero zero, zero isn't my correct move to immediately give everybody veto power? Okay, yeah, okay. In practice, as 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 I said, uh, in 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 our larger thinking and trying to draw far-fetched uh, implications of a toy, toyish uh, formal model, uh, we interpret uh, Vita power as something which is very close to um, exog exogenous things. Of course, in the real world, there, are no, there is no in exogenous protection, right? So think of, the, of this as relative. That is, uh, the Vita power is close to formal protection. I don't know. Think of that we, when we give someone veto power, this means that we give this guy a lot of guns. Just this, this amount of guns help him to have veto power. 
So that's something is as close to exogenous as possible. But then he is no longer a part of this coalition that protects uh, protects each other. Can I have a bit wider question? So your title of the talk is the exogenous property rights. However, actually uh, there are two different two different. Uh, titles of my talk. One was on the initial slide right. and another here. I, right, yes. I don't know what was on the initial slide, but... Uh, Political uh, economy of redistribution. Uh, my point is, uh, you kind of have exogenous property rights, right? You cannot take away anything from the guy. You have to have a referendum, right? To take away something from the guy. If there right. is no referendum, nobody can take away anything from anybody. No, no, no. no. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, look, look, look at look at, at this allocation. Here we interpret these uh, two guys. They are protected by formal property rights. What is which is veto power in our model? And these five guys, they protect each other. So this is the endogenous veto power. This is endogenous property rights. But they yeah. don't have a referendum to take away anything from anybody. No, we have, have a property. we have a vote. We have a vote. Right. We do not vote about granting veto power, but once there is a change in veto power, we have a vote and they, by their constitution and taking into account this but veto power, they move vote. here. Because if you don't have a vote, you can't take away anything from the guy. You have the endogenous entitlement. We cannot take away the power well, from the police people okay. because they are entitled to that power. Right? We can make a vote of that. And you know, 86% will support, you know, keeping the status quo, right? I, I mean... But it's not about the property rights. Yeah, the point is, you increase the... Uh, the intuition is you increase the of power, you will have more stable situation for the property rights. No, it's not even clear. I'm, I'm way away. I'm like, you cannot interpret that as property rights because you impose the property rights. You take it by saying that you reallocate by voting. And you cannot reallocate without... Oh, but the, 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 this is the classic definition of property rights. Of course, when you vote to tax someone, this is a violation of property rights. That's, uh, the, in, in terms of incentives that property rights provide, in terms of what we care about proper, of property rights, we economists care, voting by a parliament is exactly as harmful as the action by an executive. For economic incentives, it's, it's absolutely the same. I guess so, but jungle economics... In no. Of no, that's so that's one that's one uh, that's one way to harm property rights is to have jungle economics when uh, they uh, order each or yeah, they, when they take it uh, by by force. Right. But when the majority votes in terms of economic incentives, this is uh, as um, these are the same basically property rights. Like the uh, about property rights, what uh, what you care about is the amount. Uh, that is left after you exerted your effort, made your investment, and it doesn't matter who took this, uh, who took this amount. Well, but again, if we're going back to destroying intuitions, Madison and the others in themselves insisted that majority voting with redistributive taxation was not stable. Hence, they ruled out. Of Ma Madison hedged his bets. I see that. <laughs> yes, on the other hand, they did. They did make the income tax. That was exactly the point, no. right. And, and so to, to even talk about redistribution taxation is to miss the point that they understood this. Their claim would be the, the history of the last hundred years bears out their intuition. That as soon as you allow the capital to nose under the tent, the whole system falls apart. No, I, okay, the way I see, the way I see showing that some uh, very smart guy uh, who lived 200 years ago was wrong is to take his statement out of everything that he said, else said, and disprove it by modern, right? But by changing the statement. But by, by, in, by interpreting the way I need it. That's right, exactly. <laughs> as, no, said, as McCloskey said, said <laughs> for every A, there you can have an assumption A plus epsilon and prove anything you want. Yeah, that's a kind of a ch chip shot. <laughs> This is kind of a cheap shot. Yeah, the, 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 I, I'll, I'll continue. Yeah. So, <laughs> if you increase the number of veto players, the oh, By the way, I admire Deirdre McCloskey. She's a beautiful woman, uh, as Caitlyn Jenner is, but I do not agree on all the points that she that makes or he made. 
But so, so, so the veto players, uh, if you increase veto players, your uh, informal coalition falls apart. But if there's many, many veto players, actually everyone is better off. Is there a turning point? If you keep increasing the veto players, then actually everyone is better off. <laughs> okay, it goes, it, go, it goes back and forth. It it's goes back and forth. Yeah, it's, it's no. <laughs> Kind of, it's, kind of, it's kind of essentially not monotonic. Meaning here in this kind of models, when you have a stable set, then what it makes it stable is that when you move, when you change it, you move to an unstable, which is uh, then moves to some stable, which is very different from the initial stable, which means that you, like, whenever you, uh, wherever you order them, there is always a kind of both stable and unstable sets uh, close to each other. Yeah. yeah. And on a similar uh, case, uh, when you have your your veto power, uh, veto players, they are personal. But uh, if you go back to what probably Madison was inspired by, is the Roman idea of tribune, uh, that there are people who ever cite that. No harm uh, goes to that uh, uh, several people. So you have water player that uh, blocks the redistribution not from the himself, but from some coalition. So you add a veto player who is not just now he is a, a federal judge and you cannot redistribute from him. But now he is a federal judge from Wisconsin and he looks that uh, Wisconsin people don't get uh, too high taxes. Oh, that's, th 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 that's, that's right. Uh, th 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 that's right. But as I said, the whole the idea of exercise is to uh, sh show some flaws uh, in intuition, not to say that this is the correct picture and the former picture was totally, uh, totally incorrect. It's just it just says that when you introduce new formal institutions, this might, the result might be that you destroy some uh, informal institutions, not every case, not every time when you introduce formal institutions. Now let me briefly show, I, I will not go into much detail, but I want to uh, show you two, uh, two applications. Like suppose we start, uh, like in both applications we will have something happening and then redistribution like in our model. So here in application one, it starts with a reform. So there is, a, uh, uh, there is the initial status quo, everyone has zero, and there is a, a small cost of having a reform for every agent, right? So, and the reform is uh, some M new projects, each of which brings a benefit G, which is much larger than this small cost to legislator, right? So in post-reform allocations, we have uh, at least M players who have uh, the benefit of G. Now, it seems that a very naive intuition is that to pass this reform, you need to have first, you need to have more, uh, a, a reform that has more of these beneficial projects than the number of beta players because each of the beta players need to be, needs to be on board. And you need to have at least uh, key legislators, this is the majority requirement, uh, benefiting from this transition. Now, now suppose that first they decide whether this reform happens and then, e so each of the uh, members of the society bears the cost of epsilon and uh, M members of the society get benefit G, which is much larger than the cost. So an A intuition would say that you need to uh, give these benefits to each of the Vita players, and you need to have at least, uh, at least as many members of the society benefiting from this reform than uh, the majority requirement to pass this legislation. But with our redistribution game happening after you pass the reform, the problem is that there are a lot of players, they might think, okay, I will vote for the reform, I will, alloc I will be um, allocated these benefits, but then these benefits are going to be taken away because of this redistribution, redistribution gain. And it appears now, it appears now that you need to have much uh, more beneficial projects 
much more beneficial projects uh, than the naive intuition suggests. So like, look, at, look at the following example, that we have 11, 11 players, we have the supermajority requirement, which is simply the majority requirement. You need to have six players on board, and you have three Vita players, right? So the stable allocation here is that there is a one homogeneous group of non-Vita players of size uh, of size six. Now, suppose that this society or this legislation is proposed a reform that makes eight agents, eight of eleven, better off. The naive intuition would say, of course, it would pass. Eight players of 11, but it would not, actually. Why it would not? Because of these eight, uh, eight players, three are going to be these Vita players, and the uh, number of agents uh, of non-Vita players who get the benefits, they're going to be five. But the stable, uh, they're, they're minority, they're going to be expropriated to equilibrium. Right, so uh, this will not pass. You need to have actually, you need to have at least a reform that gives benefits to nine players, which is a much larger than just simple simple majority. The naive intuition would suggest that six units six units are going to be uh, are going to be enough, but even eight is not enough in this um, in this model. So uh, here in this in this example. It appears that when you introduce, when you make an extra legislator a Vita player, this contributes to gridlock, but for a different reason. Not because of, because of like our naive intuition with, that with the Vita players, uh, you, is, uh, the reforms are more difficult to pass. But the thing is that now, uh, with the more Vita players, you have uh, larger larger uh, endogenous Vita group. So they, you will need to have more, more, a more players to benefit from the reform to pass it. Okay, the second application, it's even simpler. So we first have an investment game and then we have our redistribution game. So first, each individual decides whether to produce. Uh, the production requires efforts and uh, if uh, the effort is su successful, and this happens with probability uh, p, then, uh, then the individual endowment increases by one. Uh, and this, uh, this is independent across players. Now, we formally set up a game. So first they invest, and then the whole redistributive game is played. But the thing here, the I think you would guess what is going to happen here. That Vita players, whose property rights are certain, they will always make efficient investment decision. And if your property rights are protected, then your efficient decision is to invest. But for endogenous Vita players, whose their property rights are equilibrium phenomenon, so they would fear that I invest, because if my property rights are protected, I would better invest. But if there are going to be not enough other people who invested, then I'm going to be, uh, um, my class will be too small to protect each other. So I'm going to be expropriated afterwards. In, in this model, this depre depresses, depresses investment and development because a lot of people, they fear to be too few after they successfully invest. It's dangerous to be um, successful when there is not enough, uh, in, uh, not enough successful people. So here, when we increase the number of Vita players, it was as a Sergei, uh, Sergei question, you have the uh, like double-edged uh, effect on, uh, on production. Those who are granted Vita power, they produce more. Their incentives improve, no question. But also it might hurt those who were uh, protected um, in equilibrium as endogenous Vita player. So now, my last slide is that um, James Madison uh, emphasized the effects of Vita players, the degree of supermajority, and they somehow thought that this is always beneficial for property rights protection. And we study whether these uh, intuitions uphold in a dynamic bargaining 
setting with endogenous status quo. Our simple model and our even more simple examples, they allow to disentangle static and dynamic effects and show existence of endogenous Vita group. And then the tension between the formal Vita power and endogenous Vita power. And both the degree of supermajority and the number of Vita players has, have a non-monotonic effect on the both efficiency and the gridlock. So I better stop here. Um, so there is a paper by the guy. Michael Chair. From 1994. Of course. The yeah. The, the largest consist of the yeah, farsighted set. Data close enough to one and you pretty much can so you save from 20 pages of yeah. What? I, I, I read this paper many times. I, this is a very smart paper. I don't know what it says. <laughs> and I never seen a person who could tell well, you well, what, well, what well, does it exactly say. What you're doing, so they say oh, well, okay, this is, a okay, this is, this, this is That's exactly what Sure, sure. The, okay, he doesn't have a game. He, he, he tries to study general property of uh, stable, stable sets. But we are not we are not advancing the theory of general theory of stable sets. We are uh, trying to build a very very simple model to discuss the interplay between formal and informal institutions. Right, so in a in, in a sense, you want to use the market for <laughs> You don't have to. all your logic that you should is just building over. The people caring more about that's First, that's totally not true, because of course if we would use the sub-game perfect equilibrium, then there will be a folk theorem, so the stable set will, will include all kind of, basically every, um, every allocation would be uh, in a stable set. So it's very critical to have Markov perfect equilibrium here. Why don't uh, why don't non vital players create an insurance mechanism to make sure that they uh, so, so that they they agree that people meant to expropriate each other a little bit to stay equal so that they can resist the bigger expropriation from the veto player? Okay, as a, uh, yeah, th that's that's a good question. Uh, I think that you, you could have these results from this model that if you start with a stable situation and you give a non-Vita player the possibility to share some of their property, to yes. give some units, yes. then uh, there will be situations they would be obviously willing to share. You, you would have a formal result about this. The, there are situations they would want. Actually, when, when, I, uh, when I had this example with this, the picture, the units, yes. uh, yeah, the yeah. guy number three would be willing to share. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because this is what is happening in reality. Yep. Clubs this. They help each other. <laughs> the cost of the yeah, Khodorkov Khodorkovsky was not just uh, fast enough in, <laughs> sh in sharing. Okay. And then we should adjourn. Oh, we should. Just just I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So well, I don't know, I don't want to increase anything or discuss too much, but uh, is there some extension possible to discuss how the beta is allocated, for example, or the majority rule? So, I mean, here you can say that exogenously they are given from the top, so there is one more beta power, uh, so one more player gets the beta power, right? Yeah. Uh, can it be endogenized? So roughly... So you, you, you suggest that they would vote over the given beta I, power? I think there could be two options. So if uh, the beta players that already have veto, they can promise to give somebody a veto, then they can actually... I mean, in, that's like in, 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 in this In this model, in, in our model, the beta players, uh, they have absolutely nothing to lose in the game. So they do not care of giving someone uh, additional veto power. In application number two, when you have an investment game, they could actually have uh, incentives to give Vita power 
because giving veto powers to someone it increases efficiency because uh, someone who has a uh, veto power who has protection, they have incentives to produce efficiently. If the other people in the society benefit from this, they would be willing to give this um, this additional veto power. So this is this okay. This is a plausible plausible extension of yeah, what we have. Then if they vote and the veto has to uh, can be allocated every round again, like uh, just imagine there's uh, one more vote. And then you will see, you will see that. Okay, can you mention that some bit of? I mean. Okay. Yeah. Actually, we we try to do an exercise where you do not get grant veto power, but you could have guarantee to some agents some amounts. So it's, it's basically corresponds to your veto power for one for one period. Yeah. Okay. Then this this will increase the bargaining power of uh, Vita, Vita, of Vita play, of, of basically of the agenda setters. So you would be, if you could do this, uh, I think there are formal results about this, not in our paper, but in, in other papers, then you could expropriate much more. Yeah. If you could promise someone not to expropriate them, or give something which is not expropriatable, then this increases your bargaining power towards the rest. No, what, what I'm saying, what, what I'm yeah. saying, if if you could promise someone that you will give uh, something and this cannot be taken away, this would help you to get these guys a vote to expropriate to expropriate others. So this basically increases your bargaining power, the, this the ability to do this. Maybe I didn't hear correctly, but increasing, the, you cannot endogenize the number of veto players. Because I would not be worse off, but I for sure may not be better off. So I prefer to keep the number of veto players as small as possible. As I, as, as I, I would not lose, but I, I may not gain. In the investment game, if someone gets a veto power, then uh, he or she has a strong incentives to invest. Right. So, if uh, in the society there is any ben benefit sure for me that other people invest, that yeah, then yeah. yeah. Yes, but only in that game. In the game yeah. So, so okay. This this is different from from Asimoglu and Robinson, where you give a vote to the poor, so that they do not fear you do not fear that they will make a revolution. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the, this was a kind of an untechnical presentation of my research and the next le lecture is a technical lecture <laughs> <laughs> about dynamics of institutions.